us off in our number 10 spot, the Sumerian Civilization. The ancient Sumerians were a group of people that suddenly became established in Mesopotamia circa 2900 BCE. No one is quite sure where they came from originally, but they believed and documented that their origins were not from planet Earth. According to ancient texts, the Sumerians were created by an alien race called the Anunnaki, who came to Earth after their planet Nibiru collided with another planet in the solar system. The aliens found themselves in short supply of gold, which they needed in their atmosphere, and saw that Earth was in high supply. So they landed here and created a new species that was half alien, half human to mine the gold for them. Now it does sound a little crazy, but the Sumerians were real and they did have advanced scientific, agricultural, and technological knowledge as well as an acute understanding of the solar system, which was highly advanced at their time. Researchers have recorded clay pot batteries that still contained electrodes, a flyable model airplane, as well as an unexplainable capability to cut large stones with exact precision. Not to mention that rockets, airplanes, and helicopters were all depicted on certain artifacts from the time too. Even stranger is that there is mitochondrial DNA evidence linked to a woman in Africa dating more than 100,000 years back near a gold mine. While of course we might never know for sure, the legend of the Anunnaki has made archaeologists question many things, and if it turns out to be true, it would certainly rewrite history. The Baghdad Battery. The Baghdad Battery is a fascinating ancient artifact that was discovered in Iraq in 1936, consisting of a clay jar with a copper cylinder and an iron rod inside. While mainstream archaeologists consider it to be a simple vessel for storing scrolls or valuables, they're not 100% sure. So some folks have entertained a more exciting possibility. Enter the aliens. I think everything I picked has some sort of uh, supposed alien connection, at least according to me, so prepare for that. Some hypothesize that this ancient relic is a sophisticated power device. According to some, ancient civilizations could have been far more advanced than we give them credit for, and they might have harnessed electricity for various purposes, but forget about human ingenuity. Maybe the Baghdad battery was brought to the fine people of Earth with the assistance of a far more advanced species from outer space. Some believe that the ancient astronauts from other worlds visited Earth in the distant past and shared their knowledge of electricity with us. Maybe they left the Baghdad battery as a small gift or a souvenir from their intergalactic journey, offering a glimpse into their advanced technology. Number 8. A Goddess On the western coast of India, there are ruins of a temple to the goddess Patini. Now that part alone is not unheard of, as temples and goddesses are a large part of Hinduism. However, what is out of the norm is they have found an underground secret chamber that's rumored to hold an underground shrine to the Egyptian goddess Isis. Now, the ruins are now owned by a Hindu temple and hence forbidden, so nobody's been able to check what's underneath them. But according to writer Mog Morgan, the idea that it is a secret shrine to the Egyptian goddess is very believable. He theorizes that an Egyptian traveler came to India and started a group dedicated to his own goddess, Isis, and that Patini could be the Indian evolution of the same deity. If only we could get into that chamber to know once and for all. Number seven, Wojtek. During the Second World War, the Polish army recruited one of the most unique soldiers ever, a bear named Wojtek. And based on the soldier's accounts, he was actually pretty damn cool. The Polish soldiers found the bear cub by the side of a road, his mother apparently having been killed by hunters. So the soldiers took him in and raised him, and a civilian refugee even helped to train the animal. In order to get him on a British transport ship, he was officially enlisted as a Polish soldier soldier, being given a paybook, serial number, and the rank of private. He would apparently sleep in the bunks with the other soldiers and was also a huge fan of beer and cigarettes. He also would do actual work for the army, helping to transport supplies and carry heavy boxes of ammunition. After the war, he was relocated to the Edinburgh Zoo where he lived out the rest of his days, passing away at the age of 21. The average lifespan of a bear is 20 to 30 years, so that's really not bad for a guy raised on beer and cigarettes. 
cigarettes. Number six, nuclear war. Did you know that we were probably a lot closer to nuclear war than we thought? Back during the Cold War in the 80s, everyone was preparing for oncoming nuclear conflict, building bunkers and hiding resources in the case of having to regrow a barren landscape. This didn't happen, and it was later revealed that we were saved from this outcome by a single man. In 1983, a freak accident where sunlight reflected off high altitude clouds caused a Soviet satellite system to indicate that there were five incoming missiles, which they of course assumed to be coming from the American military. A lieutenant colonel by the name of Stanislav reasoned that if the United States were actually starting a nuclear war, it would be a full attack and not just five missiles. So he called it a false alarm and against his orders, refused to initiate their own nuclear launch out of retaliation. Number five, New Atlantis. In 1964, Ernest Hemingway's younger brother named Lester sailed out to international waters near Jamaica and started his own country. Yeah, he sailed a barge made out of bamboo that was about eight by 30 feet and declared it a micronation that was half independent and half part of the United States. So how did he manage to do that? He discovered an obscure law called the Guano Islands Act of 1856, which says that US citizens can claim ownership of unclaimed islands that had guano deposits, which if you're not aware is bird and bat. He claimed his new nation to be called New Atlantis and even wrote a new constitution for it. Though this constitution was actually just the United States constitution with every mention of the United States being changed to New Atlantis. The plan was to use this as a publicity stunt to raise money and use the raft as a research facility. Unfortunately, New Atlantis was wrecked by a tropical storm just two years after it was constructed. Number four, the war on cats. Pope Gregory the Ninth lived from 11 1945 to 1241 and became the Pope when he was already over 80 years old. He had a history as a lawyer and was known for putting a few different motions through during his time as head of the church. Unfortunately for cat lovers, Gregory was a bit of a red flag because he was apparently more of a dog person. He put forward the first ever church documents that condemned black cats as being instruments of Satan, effectively starting the war on cats and placing a target on the head of every black cat in the area. Shortly after Gregory's time, the Black Death came about thanks to diseased rats spreading the infection all over the place and leading to a lot of people living during that era having a pretty bad time. Some people blame the Black Death on Gregory's war on cats because they say due to the reduced cat population, the rat population inflated so they were just running around willy nilly spreading disease. Number three, the Siege of Weinsberg. Weinsberg is a town near the southwest part of Germany. The name of the castle that sits above the town roughly translates to women's faithfulness castle. So why is that? In the year 1140, King Conrad III defeated the Duke of Welf and placed the town of Weinsberg under siege. The women negotiated a surrender that held the terms that they would be allowed to leave the town unharmed with whatever they could carry on their shoulders. Conrad probably thought that they were just gonna take their children, clothes, food, maybe a goat. What he didn't expect was for all the women of the town to take their husbands and other men upon their shoulders and carry them out of town. The king's people were like, yo, dude, they, you know, they can't do that. But the king was like, nah, that's actually kind of valid and let it happen, saying a king should always stand by his word. Number two, astronomer's pet moose. A 16th century astronomer who discovered the supernova was known not only for that, but also for just being a bit of a bizarre guy. A few of his odd behaviors included losing his nose in a duel, keeping a jester slash clairvoyant in his house, and having a pet moose. The pet moose was apparently just as bizarre as he was. The moose apparently lived in the castle with him and would walk alongside him like a loyal dog, and apparently also had an unquenchable thirst for Danish beer. Him and his pet became extremely popular and they would often be invited to dinner parties together to show off the moose's tame behavior. Unfortunately, the moose's alcoholism got out of control at one of these dinner parties and he had a bit too much to drink. He chugged beers with noblemen until he managed to stumble up a set of stairs in the castle before falling off and passing away. Number one, the latrine disaster of 1184. German noblemen during the Roman Empire would often meet to have discussed 
discussions over land disputes and try to find some temporary peace. King Henry VI called for a meeting over a dispute which would take place in the Church of St. Peter in Erfurt. They all gathered in a room that was directly above the building's toilet pit. The weight of all the people on the floor, add to that their heavy chain clothing, caused the floor to collapse and they all fell into the pit below. Between 60 and 100 of the people gathered there ended up passing away in the human waste, whether it be from drowning or being crushed by the floor. One of the deaths was Count Heinrich of Schwartzburg, who had previously joked he would perish in his own shit if he ever failed his title. Coming in at number 10, it's the Great Stink. Because of course it is. The sewer system in London, England prior to this happening was not a good system, to put it mildly. Human poop would often be pumped into cesspits, tanks, and big old holes in the ground that would quickly fill up and run off into the streets through culverts that ran down said streets. Or the yummy wet waste would seep into people's basements and foundations, creating pockets of methane that would cause explosions from time to time. All the sewage that did successfully go into the system, which was meant primarily for rainwater, just pumped out into the the River Thames, and even some sources of drinking water. The problem is, other than the obvious ones there, it didn't actually flow out to sea through the river. No, it actually dispersed among the river thanks to the tidal nature of said river. Which meant, for centuries, the river was just being injected with more and more and more sewage, which seeped into the ground all around the giant open sewer river that in the summer of 1958 all bubbled up to the surface thanks to the heat and released its lovely malodorous stench for all those far and wide around the city of London to sniff up. Nice. Thankfully, Joseph Bazalgette was the civil engineer placed in charge of designing the new system. And boy, did he do a good job. He basically saved the entire city. Joseph's sewers ran parallel of the River Thames and carried all the way east where it would eventually flow out in the river again, but in a place where it actually did flow out into the sea. He also developed water treatment plants along the new sewer system to clean the nastiness, and he created embankments along the river that would help stop the waste continuing to build up even further. He even came up with other ways for the city to get fresh drinking water that could be used. All so that we would never have to remember this malodorous part of history ever again. Thanks dude, you did good. Number 9, 3 for 1. Back in the day, a guy by the name of Robert Liston was renowned for being one of the fastest surgeons alive. Being fast as a surgeon then was a pretty damn good thing. And that's because the anesthesia we are accustomed to now didn't exist, so patients were awake for the entire surgery. So yeah, a quick surgery is pretty preferable. The thing with going fast though is that it's extremely easy to make a little whoopsie sometimes. For example, one time Liston was performing a leg amputation, but it turns out that he was working so fast he didn't realize he accidentally cut off two fingers of his assistant's hand. That's pretty bad, but then you learn that both the patient and the assistant passed away later of gangrene. But wait. There's even more. Doctors and medical students would often watch these surgeries from the gallery, which wasn't really a gallery like we have today. They were basically right beside you. During that same procedure that I just talked about, Liston accidentally swiped near an elderly doctor with a blade, slicing the fabric of the doctor's suit coat. Problem is, he thought he had been cut open, most likely because this guy just accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers. The doctor went into shock and passed away from a heart attack. This man took out three people just trying to save one. That's insane. Number eight, the Berlin Wall. Most people are probably aware of this, but for younger audiences, Maybe not. Basically, for about 30 years during the Cold War era, the Berlin Wall separated Germany's communist east side from the democratic west side. The makeshift wall itself was constructed overnight on the 12th and I guess the 13th of August 1961 by the German Democratic Republic to stop western fascists from entering East Germany and undermining the building of a socialist state. But really, the wall was mainly just there to stop people from defecting from the east side to the west side. It wasn't exactly a big agreed upon thing. So people in Berlin woke up on August 13th completely cut off from family, friends, work, and their own homes, with no way to get from east to west. Eventually, the quickly built wall was replaced by a 12 foot tall, 4 foot wide concrete barrier guarded and covered with booby traps. At least 171 people were killed just trying to get over, under, or around the Berlin Wall, which stood until the 9th of November 1989. Maybe we should stop building walls between each other and just accept each other. 
Number seven, Woolly Mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the Woolly Mammoth back to life. Yep. Instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago. But what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and... Well, obviously look at them. Lots of food. So they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way. They're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes combined with the preserved mammoth DNA is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, oh, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The Pyrenean Ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped more than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean Ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattle to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep, hi. Hybrid science. There we go. Let's get mixing. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot, this is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yep, they were actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the Great Auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldi Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we get a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. 
to keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbeer Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. So, I mean, from circus to science, it's like, eh, you're still, sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There are luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Maridius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in Ice Age. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous. And best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us, we, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and well, the rest is history, and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. There we go, hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty in the future. Number 10, the chimpanzee human. Also referred to as humanzees, which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A humanzee was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work, or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way he would act. He was previously a performance animal. He was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day, which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we gonna mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the number eight. Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. <laughs> It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. 
Kind of seems like we could use them. Next up, we have the Nazca Lines. The Nazca Lines are a series of ancient uh, geoglyphs located in the Nazca Desert of southern Peru. They depict various shapes, including animals, plants, and geometric patterns. And the exact purpose and meaning of these etchings remains a bit of a mystery. Some theories suggest they might have been used for astronomical or religious purposes, but the strange thing is the scale of the designs means they can really only be appreciated from the air and people weren't really looking down at the earth 2,000 years ago. So who were these for? Were they used to appease gods or maybe beings from outer space? There are all kinds of different images depicted, uh, birds, monkeys, various different plants. Probably the strangest one though is what is often referred to by archeologists as the astronaut. It's obviously a humanoid figure, but the size of the eyes and the shape of its body really does resemble some sort of spacesuit or classic extraterrestrial type being. So really leaves you with uh, more questions than answers. Coming in at number six, Pudnamabaswami Temple. In Kerala, India lies a grand temple containing six sealed underground vaults. Now, since its discovery, five of the vaults have actually been opened and inside they found treasures, jewels, and gold worth millions. But there still remains one vault they have not been able to crack. In 2014, Supreme Court appointed committee members based on a alleged mismanagement in the affairs of the temple were appointed to open the forbidden vault. First, they opened the metal grill door and discovered a sturdy wooden door just behind it. They opened this door as well and encountered a third door made of iron, which was jammed shut. The observers tried to force their way in, but failed. So they decided to hire a professional locksmith to open the door, but in mid-July, before the locksmith came, the royal family got an injunction from the Supreme Court against against opening Vault B, and by July 2020, the Supreme Court refused to give permission to open the vault, as it was an issue involving religious sentiments. But it has left many wondering, what is behind that last vault? Legend suggests that a spell is what is required to get open the last door, hence why the attempted prying methods used on the other five have been unsuccessful. But archaeologists are keen to hopefully one day be able to see what lies behind the sealed and forbidden vault. Big circles. The big circles are mysterious archaeological features found in various locations across the Middle East. So these structures are massive circular shapes visible only from above and are made of stone walls or small stone mounds spread across different locations in the region like Jordan, Syria, and Turkey. And they vary in size with some stretching over 400 meters in diameter. But what were they built for? Nobody really knows. One of the most puzzling aspects of the big circles is their age, which is challenging to figure out without any artifacts connected with them or, or written records. Archaeologists have found it tough to date these structures accurately, leading to debates about their origins and the cultures that might have created them. Lots of theories have emerged in an attempt to unravel the purpose of these massive circles. Some researchers have put forward that the circles served as burial sites. Others speculate they may have been used to house animals, but the walls aren't really high enough for that. Most of them are only built like a few feet high. Of course, we have a bit of a similarity here to crop circles, and we all know the conspiracies surrounding them. So yeah, maybe, again, aliens, they could have a hand to play here too. Next up at number Four ape bones. At the hill of Tara in Ireland, a set of strange bones were found, but they don't look like bones of a normal person. They belonged to an ape. And to make matters crazier, it's not even the only set of ape bones that have been found in Ireland. But the thing is, nobody knows how these apes managed to get there in the first place. And the only explanation is that someone a long time ago was taking apes up to Ireland and burying them there. One theory suggests that the apes might have been traded, but another theory is based on an Irish legend. The ancient legend claims that a group of strangers with magical powers came to Ireland on a massive ship and ruled the people from the hill of Tara. Some think that the legend
illusion was based on a real event and that the people they thought were magic were really a group of Egyptians with advanced technology. Now this might seem a little out there, but despite that there are no native monkeys in Egypt itself, ancient Egyptians were incredibly familiar with monkeys and they have held a permanent place in ancient Egyptian religion as one of the more important animal forms into which the gods might be transformed. On top of that, there's been actual DNA testing done on ancient Irish bodies that suggest they could have an ancestor from the Middle East. And near the hill of Tara, there are 3,800 year old remains of a boy wearing what appears to be an Egyptian necklace. Next up we have hobbits. In 2003, scientists found some bones in Indonesia on the island of Flores. These bones belong to small human-like species they named Homo floresiensis or Hobbits. The hobbits were tiny, around three feet tall, and were determined to have lived an estimated 50,000 to 100,000 years back. This discovery really changed how we think about our own ancestors. Before it was believed that only our species, Homo sapiens, had big brains and were smarter than other ancient humans, but the hobbits' small brain challenged that idea. It made us realize that early human relatives were more diverse and interesting than we thought. Some researchers think that the hobbits might have come from an earlier human human group and experienced kind of an island dwarfism adapting to the new environment over time. Small islands can have a weird effect on the animals that live on them, but it's still not 100% known. Find taught us that the story of human evolution is even more complicated than we thought before. Who knows what other species of ancient humans there could have been roaming around that we still, you know, haven't discovered yet. They could also, of course, be aliens, but I, I don't actually know. I don't actually think that. Coming in at number two, Lovelock Cave. In 1911, miners working in Nevada's Lovelock Cave were digging through piles of guano when they stumbled upon a massive wealth of ancient relics. The miners began searching, and as they sifted through the relics, they found something as exciting as it was confusing. The mummified remains of a six foot six man with red hair. With this discovery, the cave became an archaeological dig site, and soon even more strange discoveries were being made. Things like 15-inch sandals which appeared to have been used, as well as a giant handprint that was twice the size of any normal handprint. Now, what is extremely incredible about the discovery is that there is an old Paiute legend that talks about red-haired, freckled-faced, man-eating giants who invaded the land and preyed on the Paiute people until they managed to chase the giants into a cave and set it on fire. And some have reason to believe that this archaeological discovery could actually back up the legend. Sadly, the original red-headed mummy has been destroyed, which makes everything a bit more difficult to prove. But one explanation is that the giants could have been a real group of violent European explorers, people who tormented the indigenous peoples and then met their end in Nevada. The anti Kythera mechanism, a very fascinating archaeological discovery that continues to puzzle researchers to this day. It was found in 1901 off the coast of the Greek island of Antikythera in the wreckage of an ancient ship. The device seems to be this intricate mechanical calculator, believed to date back between 150 and 100 BC. Its purpose and origin still not 100% known, but its complexity is pretty astonishing, especially for the time, meaning that more advanced technology could have been present in ancient times that we're completely unaware of. Some researchers think it was used for astronomical calculations or as a calendar, but it's kind of still speculative. What they do know is that the level of craftsmanship and sophistication involved is pretty impressive. It changed assumptions about ancient technology, and despite extensive research, certain aspects of its design and function remain unknown. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the crystal skulls. The ancient crystal skulls found in Mexico and Central America are a group of pre-Columbian artifacts that are believed to be over a thousand years old. These skulls are made out of clear or milky quartz and are intricately carved to resemble human skulls. Despite being discovered in the 19th and 20th centuries, their true origin and purpose remains a mystery. According to legend, the crystal skulls were created 
created by the Maya or the Aztecs and are said to possess magical powers that can heal or grant spiritual enlightenment to those who come in contact with them. Some people believe that the crystal skulls are extraterrestrial in origin and that they hold the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Many theories have been put forth over the years about the purpose and significance of the crystal skulls. Some researchers believe that they were used for religious or ceremonial purposes, while others speculate that they may have been used for divination, or even as tools for communication with otherworldly beings. Despite decades of research and study, the true origins and purpose of the crystal skulls remain shrouded in mystery. In our number 9 spot today, we have Linear A. Linear A is an undeciphered script used by the Minoan civilization between 1800 and 1450 BCE. The script was first discovered in 1900 by British archaeologist Arthur Evans and was used to write the Minoan language, which is also still largely unknown. Linear A is composed of over a hundred different signs, including pictograms and ideograms, but it is believed to be a syllabic script, meaning that each sign represents a syllable or sound. Despite numerous attempts by researchers to decipher the script, its meaning and purpose remains a mystery. The mystery surrounding Linear A is compounded by the fact that the Minoan civilization itself is shrouded in mystery, with little known about its social structure, economy, or religious practices. The decipherment of Linear A could potentially shed light on these enigmatic aspects of Minoan culture, but for now the script remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the ancient world. In our number 8 spot today we have the Tartaria Tablets. These are a set of three clay tablets discovered in 1961 in Romania, dating back to the Neolithic era around 5300 BCE. The tablets contain a series of symbols that are thought to be the oldest form of writing in Europe. While there is still much debate about the meaning of the symbols and whether they constitute as a true writing system, many researchers believe that they represent a form of proto-writing or proto-cuneiform. The tablets have caused controversy in the archaeological community with some experts questioning their authenticity and others arguing that they represent a significant discovery that could change our understanding of early human communication. Despite their importance, the Tartaria tablets remain largely shrouded in mystery and their true meaning and purpose may never be fully understood. Number 7. The Disappeared I can honestly say that I never knew about this, and I think the US involvement may be why no one wants you to know. Also, forewarning, I'm sorry if I mispronounce anything here. Feel free to correct me down below, and that goes for all the points. So, in September 1973, Chile's president, Salvador Allende, was overthrown in a coup that was assisted by the US government. General Augusto Pinochet then took over, and he was not good. Augusto was a very ruthless leader and did not let up on anyone who spoke out against him. Journalists, politicians, celebrities, pretty much anyone who spoke out seemed to suddenly disappear. Some were later found in alleyways or ditches all over Santiago, while others were never found at all. This American backed leader essentially used the National Stadium as a secret terror base where he rounded up those who opposed him and did some pretty unspeakable things. During the 17 years that he ruled, around 40 thousand people were subjected to horrible treatment, while at least 3,200 of them passed away or just straight up disappeared. Number 6. Atom Bomb Baby J. Robert Oppenheimer first witnessed the devastation caused by the device that he created on July 16, 1945. He was not wrong to be afraid of it. Ever since the obliteration of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, taking the lives of between 129,000 and 226,000 people, the entire world knows the absolute world ending potential nuclear war could unleash. Oppenheimer was the leader of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico, beginning in 1942, which was basically meant to figure out how to use atomic energy for the military. They were successful enough that it directly led to Oppenheimer wanting to completely stop development, and then when they wouldn't, he straight up resigned. Instead, he became chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission, and in October 1949, he opposed the development of the devices that he helped create. This simple opposition led to him being labeled a communist supporter, suspended from secret nuclear research, and stripped of his security clearance by the Atomic Energy Commission. As soon as these devices were created and we saw their full unbridled power, not to mention the fallout that takes place afterwards, I think we can all say we would like to forget 
forget that this level of destruction is even real in the first place. Number five, saved. We may want to forget the destructive power of those nuclear devices, but we should acknowledge two times that we were saved from all out nuclear war. The first incident was in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Soviet Vice Admiral Vasily Arkhipov, which I think I pronounced right, was on board a nuclear sub near Cuba. Unfortunately, the submarine was unable to pick up any incoming radio signals, which freaked everyone out on board and they were unsure whether war had actually started or not. There was a vote among three officers on whether or not to launch a nuke. We need to thank all our lucky stars that Vasily, being the lone no vote, saved us all on that day. But there was another time. In 1983, during the Cold War, sunlight reflecting off of high altitude clouds confused the Soviet missile detection system, causing it to indicate that there were five incoming missiles assumed to be American. A lone Soviet Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov reasoned that if the US was initiating nuclear war, it would likely be an all out attack and not just five missiles. He was right, and against military orders, Petrov determined it to be a false alarm and avoided a retaliatory launch by the USSR. Arkhipov and Petrov avoided all out nuclear war. Never forget these guys. Number 4, Chinatown, LA. I bet you won't find this one in your history books, kids, but you should. In 1871, specifically on October 24th, 1871, a large mob of about 500 white men raided Chinatown in Los Angeles. This resulted in the brutal passing of at least 20 Chinese Americans, but on top of that, the mob also stole an estimated $1.5 million worth of property. Even though there is absolutely no justification for this level of animosity, the mob formed in response to a shootout that had taken place that same day that ended up taking the life of police officer Robert Thompson. That itself caused a commotion and people began shouting the absolutely horrible statement that the Chinese were trying to take the lives of white people. You add some fear together with some ignorance and a large heaping spoonful of racism and boom, a mob emerged. It was the very start of a decade of similar occurrences against Asian American communities in the US, which even led to the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited all immigration of Chinese laborers. It's horrible, but that's America's history, ain't it? Number three, the Salem Witch Trials. Speaking of American history and irrational fear, ever heard of the Salem Witch Trials? You probably have. Between June and September of the year 1692, around 19 men and women were found guilty of witchcraft and burned at the stake in the small, seemingly super religious community of Salem, Massachusetts. The obvious idiocracy and horror of this event shocked the world, and in an almost sick twist of things, the trials have spawned hundreds of films, books, scholarly articles, and plays. The men and women that lost their lives that day were convicted of their witchcraft crime based on the evidence of a group of young village girls who claimed to have been, quote, bewitched. The fear of this was compounded by family feuds and Native American attacks, and it developed into the complete madness and hysteria that quickly spread throughout colonial Massachusetts. After that initial burning, another 150 men and women were accused in the spring of 1692 and were only allowed to survive if they confessed to the crime of witchcraft. Number two, Chernobyl. Chernobyl is the site of the Soviet nuclear power plant that in April of 1986 had a serious accident due to flawed reactor design and staff that didn't really get the best training. The cause of the accident itself was explained really really well in the HBO miniseries and at the trial that took place in real life. And I'm much too silly to explain how it happened here, but it resulted in a steam explosion and fires that released 5% of the radioactive core into the environment. Just 5%. The explosion itself ended two workers lives with acute radiation poisoning affecting a confirmed 123 people and ending 28 of those people's lives. Around 5,000 cases of thyroid cancer with 15 fatal incidents were probably caused by the radioactive iodine fallout. Look, it was not good. It was scary. And what was potentially even scarier was the way people tried to cover it up. So maybe, maybe it's best that we don't forget about this one. And finally, in at number one, it's Armenia. Now I didn't know about this one either, so it looks like we're both learning today, huh? Armenia became part of the Ottoman Empire all the way back in the 15th century and was for the most part a Christian country. The Ottoman leaders were not very happy about this. In fact, they were furious. Mistreatment of Christian Armenians became pretty regular and they were usually taxed more heavily and were given even fewer rights.
Israelites. Naturally, as you may expect, Armenians began to protest, but that wasn't going to be allowed to happen for long. Turkish military officials began slaying hundreds of thousands of Armenian people beginning in 1896. In 1914, after the Turks entered World War I on the side of the Germans, that's when the real death toll began to rise. Military leaders somehow determined that the Armenians were traitors, and so on April 24th, 1915, they took the lives of hundreds of Armenian leaders, which only led to more attacks against the Armenian people, and that all continued until 1922. The numbers don't really seem real, but more than 1 million Armenians lost their lives between 1915 and 1922. Look, I'm glad we are all now pretty aware of the horror that humans are capable of. Kicking off the list at number 10, a really old bird. Yep, I'm kicking this list off with a tiny Chinese bird, a little wooden bird. This figurine is incredibly old. It looks like a wooden Monopoly piece almost. It's tiny. And when I say old, I mean like really old. It was carved 13,000 years ago. To give you an idea of how old that is, the pyramids aren't even 5,000 years old yet. Yep, mind blown. Just hit you with that one. About half an inch tall, small sculptures like these, perching birds to be more specific, were quite common in ancient Chinese art forms from the Neolithic age. Back in 1958, at the Lingjing site in China, a well was dug out. Now the construction crew went about 16 feet down, and unbeknownst to them, the dirt pile that was accumulating held secrets to our history. Inside this pile, there were ancient tools, sculptures, broken ceramics, then cut to 2005, archaeologists at Shandong University found one of the most most important piles of dirt in the world. More importantly, they found this tiny little bird. How cute is that? And you could eat this thing, it's that small. Any piece of history that you could eat, that's rare. That's a pretty rare find. It's like finding a diamond, it's so small. Number nine, Dark Ages tomb. Looking back to the Dark Ages in Shamir Heights, northern Israel, this tomb is massive. It's made up of 400 tons of boulders and stretches to about 65 feet wide. This burial chamber goes back to 4,000 years ago. It could mean that humans were part of an organized society that long ago, especially consider the art that they found on the ceiling inside the dolmen. Check this out. This is the first time art has been documented in one of these chambers in the Middle East, and we haven't quite figured out what the ceiling carvings depict yet. So so far, we think arrows or anchors of some sort, but inside the actual grave, there were three sets of human remains found as well, so it had been used for quite some time. While excavating the ancient grave site, archaeologists also found colored beads. One of the most intriguing parts of this grave has to be the lines carved onto the ceilings. All these lines connecting to one arc. What does it mean? Any thoughts? Put them down below. Number eight, the fall of the Roman Republic. Okay, looking back to 44 BC, we thought Julius Caesar getting was a major factor for the Roman Republic's downfall. Well, you know what's even more dangerous than a bunch of dudes running at Julius Caesar? A volcano. Yeah, it's a bit louder too. Thanks to science, we think the main villain in this story came from 6,000 miles away. About a year before Caesar's death, the Omak volcano went off on an island near Alaska. Now the ash cloud that drifted over afterwards, they were such a big deal, and we believe that it caused Rome's social downfall. We look at Arctic ice samples like we do with tree rings. We can literally see layers of history. So we compared the volcanic material to rocks surrounding the volcanoes, and you know, we connect the dots. Bob's your uncle. Sorry, Julius Caesar. We thought you were kind of cooler. I don't know. You're still pretty cool. In our number seven spot today, we have the stone spheres from Costa Rica. These ancient stone balls found in Costa Rica are a collection of nearly perfect spherical stones, ranging in size from a few centimeters to over two meters in diameter. These stone balls were created by the Dequise culture between 700 and 1530 CE, and they were discovered in southern Costa Rica in the 1930s. They have since become an archaeological mystery with many unanswered questions questions about their origins, purpose, or how they were made. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding the stone balls is how they were created. The spheres are made of granite and other hard stones, and they were perfectly shaped without the use of any modern tools or technology. Some have suggested that they were made using some sort of unknown technique, or that they were created with the help of extraterrestrial technology. Another mystery surrounding the stone balls is their purpose. Some believe that they were used as part of a game, while others argue that they had a more practical use, such as astronomical observations, or as a status symbol. However, no definitive answers have ever been found. The stone balls have also raised questions about the Dequise culture itself. Despite their impressive creations, very little is known about the people and their language and written records, which have not survived. This lack of knowledge 
knowledge has made it difficult to fully understand the significance of the stone balls and their role in the culture. In our number six spot today, we have the Piri Reese map. The Piri Reese map is a world map created by Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reese in 1513. The map is notable for its accurate representation of South America and Antarctica, which were not officially discovered until centuries later. Of course, this means that what has puzzled researchers is the source of his knowledge. One theory is that Piri may have had access to ancient maps that are no longer in existence, such as the Library of Alexandria, which was destroyed in a fire in the 1st century BCE. Others speculate that he may have had contact with extraterrestrial beings who provided him with advanced knowledge of geography and cartography. What makes the Piri Reese map even more mysterious is the presence of features that are not visible in modern maps. For example, the map includes a land bridge between South America and Antarctica, which has been confirmed by modern satellite imagery. However, this land bridge was only discovered by modern science in the 20th century. Another mystery surrounding the Piri Reese map is the presence of a series of markings and symbols that appear to depict astronomical and astrological data. Some researchers believe that these symbols may have been used for navigation or even to track the movement of the stars. Despite decades of research and study, the true source of Piri Reese's knowledge and the purpose of the markings on the map remain a mystery, making it one of the most enigmatic ancient artifacts to this day. In our number five spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek artifact discovered in 1901 by a group of sponge divers off of the coast of the island of Antikythera. The device, which is believed to date back to the second or first century BCE, is a very complex mechanism made up of gears and cogs, and it is thought to have been used to predict astronomical events and the cycles of the solar and lunar calendars. What makes this mechanism so mysterious is its advanced technology and the fact that nothing else like it has been discovered from the same time period. The device is believed to have been incredibly sophisticated for its time, and its level of complexity was not achieved again until the development of similar technology during the Renaissance over a thousand years later. The mechanism is also mysterious because its purpose and origin are still not fully understood. Despite extensive research and analysis, there is still much that remains unknown about the device, including who built it and how it was used. The Antikythera mechanism remains a fascinating artifact, and it continues to capture the imagination of scientists, historians, and just the general public. In our number four spot today, we have the Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is a very mysterious book that dates back to the 15th century, written in an unknown script and illustrated with strange drawings of plants, animals, and astrological symbols. The manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, a rare book dealer who acquired the book in 1912. What makes the Voynich Manuscript so mysterious is the fact that no one has been able to decipher its contents or identify the language it is written in. The strange drawings and symbols have baffled scholars for centuries, and many theories have been proposed as to its purpose and origin. Some believe that the manuscript is a secret code or cipher, while others speculate that it is a lost alchemaic text or an early form of cryptography. Despite extensive efforts to decipher the manuscript, its secrets remain unsolved and it continues to be a source of fascination and speculation for scholars and enthusiasts alike. The Voynich manuscript is a testament to the enduring power of mystery and intrigue, and it serves as a reminder of the vastness and complexity of human human knowledge and understanding. Maybe this book that we have is holding on to some of the most important secrets that have just been lost to time. In our number three spot today, we have the works of old men. The works of old men are structures that were first observed from the air by a British pilot in 1927, and they are located near the Azraq Oasis in Jordan. There are hundreds of these wheel-like structures that are over 80 feet wide, some even as large as 200 feet. These huge structures have been dated back so far that they might just be the oldest man-made creations that we have ever found. While this is all amazing, we have absolutely no idea what they are or why they were created. The theories range from things like sun tracking to ceremonies to some sort of spiritual relevance, but we really just aren't sure. Well, things like this are incredible finds, and it's amazing that some of the first man-made things still exist on our Earth. It is insane how we have no idea what they are or how to use them, and unfortunately, especially because of the fact that it's been thousands and thousands of years, it's most likely that the mysteries surrounding them are totally lost with the past. In our number two spot 
today we have the Drapa stones. These stones were found by archaeologists in China. There were hundreds of discs made of stone that were found under a ton of dust inside of a cave. The notable thing about these discs is that they resemble phonography records with a hole in the center that leads into a spiral groove. These stones are at least 10,000 years old and the groove in them is made up of super small hieroglyphics. Here's the kicker though, these hieroglyphics were deciphered and found to have stories of spaceships crashing into mountains. These spaceships were apparently being flown by what was called Drapa. After this discovery, the researcher who found it was ridiculed as people believed it was ridiculous, but years later some Russian researchers asked for a few of the stones to examine. Upon the Russian examination, they found some sort of extraordinary vibration or hum coming from the stones. After this, research on the stones either stopped or has just been hidden from the public. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Indus Valley Script. This is an ancient writing system that was used by the Indus Valley Civilization, one of the earliest known civilizations in the world. The script is believed to have been in use from sometime around 2600 to 1900 BCE, and it is one of the few ancient scripts that has yet to be deciphered. The Indus Valley script consists of over 400 different symbols, which have been found on seals, pottery, and other artifacts from the civilization. Despite numerous attempts to decipher the script, researchers have been unable to identify the language or meaning behind the symbols. The mysterious nature of the Indus Valley script has led to much speculation about the civilization that created it. Some researchers believe that the symbols may have been used for religious or ritual purposes, while others suggest that they may have been used for trade or administration. Regardless of their purpose, the symbols remain a fascinating mystery of the ancient world, and their true meaning may never be fully understood. Number 10, the 1904 Olympic Marathon. The 1904 Olympic Marathon probably had some of the most interesting competitors ever. It wasn't just one person who made this race bizarre, but a whole handful of people and strange circumstances. First off, the course was just absolutely covered in dust, and breathing it in caused a bunch of the runners to suffer severe internal injuries. So right off the bat, the race just totally sucked. The man who finished the race in first place got some bad cramps and decided he was just gonna hitch a ride in a car. Then he got out near the finish line and ran across. The guy who came in second place was given a mixture of different foods and chemicals, which were actually a poison used to kill rodents, but they were trying to use it as like a steroid to make him a better runner, and instead his crew ended up carrying him across the finish line. The guy who came fourth gambled all his money when he got to the United States and ended up having to wear full dress clothing to the race, using a knife to cut his pants into shorts. He then ate some apples during the race, got sick, and took a nap, but still came forth. Number nine, Robert Liston surgery. We all know that medical practices throughout history were a bit dodgy, and they didn't have a lot of the comforts that we have today. A man named Robert Liston was known as one of the fastest surgeons in the 1800s, and you had to be fast because they didn't have anesthesia, so surgery basically sucked for everybody involved. Liston also became the only person to perform a surgery with a 300% mortality rate. He was performing a leg amputation surgery, but worked so fast he accidentally cut off two of his assistant's fingers. Both the patient and the assistant died of infection because the saw he used was dirty. The third death occurred when during the procedure Liston accidentally sliced a nearby doctor's coat but just the coat. The doctor thought he had been cut open, went into shock, and died of a heart attack, leading to three people dying during an operation meant to just save one person. Number eight, Salem Tomato Trial. We're all well aware of the Salem Witch Trials, but you've probably never heard of the Salem Tomato Trials. In the early 1800s, tomatoes were put on trial in Salem, New Jersey, because they were believed to be poisonous. The tomato was also considered a sinful fruit because it can act as a mild aphrodisiac. Only one man in the town defended tomatoes during the trial and even tried to bring about tomato growing competitions so people would be less afraid. He would also regularly eat them in front of everybody, leading most people to think he was completely insane. Growing annoyed with the trial and fear of tomatoes, he decided to walk in front of the courthouse with an entire basket of tomatoes in his hands. He then proceeded to eat the entire pile of tomatoes as a crowd gathered 
around and watched, and to their shock, the man did not immediately die. This was enough to finally convince people that tomatoes were not evil. Number 7. A Really Old Cat We've covered the Nazca lines here on this channel before, but have you heard about this relaxing fat boy? The Nazca Desert in Peru was already fascinating with its geoglyphs, but among the 2000 year old massive pieces of ancient art, we had this massive cat that predates the Nazca lines. See, the cat was from the late Paracas era, around 500 BC, whereas the lines were from the Nazca culture around 700 AD. It's about 37 meters long. It's big, and we caught it last year at a pretty good time. It was actually really close to fading away thanks to natural erosion, and now the fat cat has since been conserved. Let's go pet it. Let's go pet this giant cat on this big hill. Imagine seeing that. I'd be like, oh, great joke, guys. No, it's a real thing from thousands of years old. No idea why. Number six, Forrest Fenn's treasure. Somebody called Nicolas Cage. We found treasure. We did it. And by we, I mean the 33-year-old Michigan medical student, Jack Stueff. Back in 2010, to fill you in a bit, millionaire Forrest Fenn kicked off a literal treasure hunt. He said he'd hidden a million dollars worth of treasure in the Rocky Mountains somewhere, and the only clue as to where it lays was a 24-line poem. Yeah, like it's Zelda Breath of the Wild. How exciting is that? This treasure brought in thousands of hunters, obviously, five of which lost their lives trying to find this thing. It was a big deal. Jack only found out about this treasure hunt in 2018, so he was late to the party, yet still he found it. Interesting. Obviously, there's no details as to where it was found. Jack remained anonymous for quite some time, because there were legal battles, there were court dates, and honestly, I'd love to see a movie about this whole thing and how it went down. Show us the story of Forrest Fenn's hidden treasure hunt. Add a little Hans Zimmer in the background. Debit. I'll go see that movie twice. Number five, Ice Age art. More ancient artwork, this time from the Colombian Amazon. Thing is, unlike other drawings found on the ceilings of tombs, this canvas stretches about eight miles. The paintings are even more impressive than that. Dating back to 12,000 years ago, these drawings were made near the end of the last ice age. Thousands of paintings, by the way, not just a handful of arrows either, a lot. These were found in 2017, but it was only last year when they went public with their findings. Those findings being paintings of elephants, massive sloths, horses from the ice age, snakes, birds, and deer. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Pregnant women or the origins of the Ninja Turtles. Number four, more mummies. Summer 2020, while most of the world was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they're occupied. Found of course in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archeologists have never been more excited. And honestly, I'm pretty jazzed too. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind blowing. Because grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days and for all those to be untouched for this long, crazy. The findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations like Persians and Greeks. And the idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but I've seen too many Brennan Fraser classics to not be a little concerned at the same time. Please don't open them. I don't know, just leave them. We don't really need to know. Do we? We opened a sarcophagus and like this ooze came out and now coronavirus is a thing. I'm just saying, do the math. You just check out. Number three, an ancient zoo. Many moons before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were visiting petting zoos. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was a booming town, sitting alongside the Nile River. In Mike Tyson fashion, you would flaunt your wealth by getting an exotic animal as a pet. Yeah, as a pet is very important here. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green. They were the ones who discovered that this town was thriving with over 10,000 residents. But when further studies were performed, we also discovered the remains of elephants, baboons, and a hippo, right next to the remain of their owner. Of course, what a weird funeral. These archeologists found remains of baboons surrounding humans. I can only imagine their first thought upon finding this. We found a body next to a hippo. Is this a crime scene or an unbreakable bond. Animals are cute, you know, even if they're hippos that can eat your head. Still nice. Number two, Otzi the Iceman. Discovered in September 1991, this mummy was found on the border of Austria and Italy. He's Europe's oldest known and natural mummy. He was covered in ice shortly after his death, so most of the 45 year old man from the Copper Age was left in rather good condition. I say that, I mean he's a literal corpse, like bones, but it was good condition for a mummy. A 5,000 year old man was found in ice. Take that Captain America, eat that. Before he died in the Italian Alps, Otzi had a number of health problems. He had arthritis, Lyme disease, and he was lactose intolerant, which I think is the worst of all. Thanks to science, we know that Otzi the Iceman was sharpening his tools right before his death. It's almost like he had a hunch. 
that he was about to be brutally killed. Sorry, Yahtzee. Number one, the origins of spirituality. Cave drawings go back thousands of years. We're still trying to find the origins of spirituality in a sense. You know, these gods are appearing in all these religions. These half human, half animal hieroglyphs are popping up. We've recently found a cave painting going back 44,000 years ago. That's making us rethink Neanderthals and their ability to create spiritual drawings. Now, a team from Griffith University found this painting in an Indonesian cave in the island of Sulawesi. Again, these half human figures appearing ages ago. This is kind of creepy. This predates the old paintings found in Europe. They were thinking of creatures, these spiritual theanthropies, long before others, meaning that this could be the first example of culture and spirituality ever to exist. Thousands of years from now, archaeologists are going to find this abandoned tunnel in the middle of nowhere, and then right on the ceiling it will say, James was here, and Sharpie. That'll be the next version of this in millions of years. Art is art, even if it's, you know, someone drawing something in a bathroom stall or someone drawing something in a cave 45,000 years ago. I kind of like the latter a bit more. <laughs>